Yeah. Give it to me now. Uh. Yeah. Bring the noise now. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Give it to me now. Give it to me. Make way for the war path. The psychopath on the astral black. Killing something up, I break a habit fast. The impossible on your way down. Scream to run them off. From Quran to go, my mission to pop. Simple. Leaving lyrics in the hospital. Your dad is part of Fuck the bill, tongue is double ass, likes to kill. Many blood that fled teams under that. Chops ahead, city slicking cases past the bed. On the DL. What the hell, dead tells don't tell. Clean the hell with the angel death still riding trail. City monks and killer we chill us. But though I'm the devil. Tracks out of filler, body bags by the million, but let's keep me ill. Plus, I need a count, let's keep a track on all. My killers rage the storm before the calm, deadly, and all. Call a desert storm, I swing the atoms of mega bomb. Keep a clean, no one stands, it's ATL's flat. Man, let's go break it to the fan who did. Remember, tough, draw up the angel depths, set the set. Sex and they don't even lyrics in a total wreck. This is a journey through the halls of hell. A journey that I burn me and all. Sturdy germs and scabies from the rat bites Your skin decays as you choke and gasp From the fumes you consumed or the poison of an asp As the body releases solids, liquids and gases Thirsty worms suck the fluids, your life flashes You lay down in the dust, body bubbling with hot pus He lay naked and unsacred Blasphemed the sons of man but didn't make it Many get it started all fast and evil blessed Nevertheless, death not resting in peace Cease, please, stress Towards my mental, because the beast has very weak potential. Every day I release bombs, leave me under the bottom of a well. I've been attacked by spells since my eyes opened up in hell. My mind seems faster than the past is lies. Before I'm convinced, it makes no sense. Push your heart, don't hope to die. You've been promised in disguise. Life is only blossoming for your eyes and your mind. Lost in the dark, it takes much to survive. There's too many ways different for the world to just stop. You lost your common and dropped your sense. I forgot your brain was in your head. So I had raised the dead to reality. Was it sad me? Was it bad me? The results is tragedy. To the lines of my enemies, my horror is scoping me. The devil eyes are choking me. Hopefully, I'm getting to open the minds I'm supposed to be. Die, that doesn't go with I. It's against I. Pride, and I decide I'm a side of action. What's happening is now. The future bring the answers. Attracting the devil to wanna dance to my level. Don't bless me, 'cause I ain't gonna wait for you to do it. Prison, the limitation of nation of our creation. Smears, confusion, babies born with dead in isolation, the hell of pollution. Police and chemicals, my psychological analogy burns a hole through reality. Corrupting my levels, devils committing sin. One who was not aware but surely faced up in the fucking I end. I pain, separation to your whole frame. My mic is changed when I rap and make it rain. A chief chancellor, when I rap I leave no answers. I go into the grits and give a nigga bone cancer. cancer. When I deliver, I give off shivers. You with your soul. Your creator, the Dark Vader. I send that feeble ass back to the incubator. Fuck with me, you're better off eating pork on the grounds of Mecca. The killer priest, the lethal rap ejector. I'm full of fury and anger, which is my slogan. Your pop shoulda bust you in the Trojan. You wanna battle? Here's your teeth and ring and your fucking rattle and your horsey in your saddle and your fucking pacifier. I'm gonna baptize you, then blast your ass with fire. You better check my rendezvous. Before you ask me sitting on a panel, I'm fucking down to you. I'm fucking sick. You better check my past life. I'm killing priests. You better fucking ask Christ. And when I'm finished, the ass will be a Jehovah Witness or Richard Simmons searching for a fucking fitness. I don't give a fuck if you exercise, since you expect to try. You be the next to die. The killer priest. Hear me testify. Testimony. The five are angels. Sixty seconds sad.
Baker left their PTL mansion in South Carolina today, but just to go out for lunch. Their bodyguard told reporters the Bakers are not ready to leave for good. Bruce Hall has the latest. Except for an occasional visit to a restaurant or neighbors, Jim and Tammy Baker are remaining in virtual seclusion in their luxury Lakeside, South Carolina home. However, PTL officials say they will not enforce a Monday deadline to evict them. As a practical matter, knowing that they haven't even begun to pack anything, I'm certainly not going to enforce that as the date they must be out of the residence. But the highly emotional battle between Baker and Jerry Falwell supporters continues, with arguments breaking out at a gathering of PTL lifetime contributors. Let him sell everything he has and give it back to PTL, and we will welcome him it's back be to become Jim, Jim Jones. Jones. No, 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 he's going to become no, a Jim a, Jones. You're the Jim Jones. He's going to save the name he's of Jesus. Jesus. And he's, he's a, a, he's a, a the Lord. And, and just the remember what Jesus did to Sodom and Gomorrah. Partners Association claims it has now signed up more than 10,000 Baker supporters, but Jerry Falwell disputes that figure. So all I can say is that the few little dissidents, and my guess is you could get them all on this porch here without being half as crowded as we are today, do not speak for anyone but themselves and their own selfish interest. But the internal fighting among PTL contributors is expected to continue as long as Jim and Tammy Baker remain in the Carolinas. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Tiga K, South Carolina. Much of Today's Texas chapter in the saga of Jim and Tammy Baker finds them facing a deadline. They're supposed to get out of their $400,000 lakefront parsonage in South Carolina by day's end. But PTL officials say they'll not evict the Bakers today. The two disgraced evangelists are still grabbing headlines. They arrived in South Carolina with Tammy What's Baker kissing the ground. The Bakers say they are fighting to return to television, fighting to reclaim their property. But now the PTL Board of Directors has put a federal judge between the Bakers and their assets and in the way of the ministry's creditors. The board has filed for protection under the federal bankruptcy code, and a judge is in control. With us now is the man who's in charge of reforming the PTL, the Reverend Jerry Falwell. He joins us live via the TV facilities of his Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. Good morning, Reverend Falwell. Morning. In filing for Chapter 11 under the bankruptcy code, you do hold your creditors at bay, but don't you also lose control of uh, the PTL finances and how the debt is paid off? Hopefully not. I'm very uh, hopeful that the court will find it uh, possible to make us debtor in charge. That is, in the way that Texaco and others allowed to go ahead with a, uh, a very careful operation of the ministry as in the last two months. You were originally against this, and then you sort of acquiesced on this. How do you feel about it now? Do you think it was the right thing to do? Well, it was the only thing to do. We uh, had a number of lawsuits, and many, many more were imminent because we were $23 million in arrears with a $70 million total indebtedness. However, it's important to say that PTL is not bankrupt or insolvent in the sense that some would uh, define it. The assets far outweigh the liabilities, and it is the opinion of the board that within the next year or less, we will be able to pay every uh, valid creditor 100 cents on the dollar. And hold on to the assets in the process? And, yes, hold on to the assets and, and bring the ministry out in less than a year. Where as, will the money come from? Well, the donors uh, have been supporting overwhelmingly. The last six weeks, uh, the contributors have given more to the ministry than ever in the history of the ministry before. In light of the bankruptcy proceedings, the protection uh, under Chapter 11, though, do you think that the money will continue to pour in? You went before the people and said, come up with a fast $7 million, then you upped it to $10 million to save the PTL. In effect, they may not have done that. Well, the people did, in fact, give, and we broke all records. We didn't reach us the seven. We reached it $8.5 million in the one month. They continue to give, and we are going to appeal to, to them today and this week by mail and by television to... Uh, help us now in these next few months to, uh, with protection and assistance from the federal court, to bring this ministry out intact, the theme park, the television network, all in as one entity and totally committed to the Christian ministry as it was started. Will these people who you hope to come forward with donations be able to find out where their money is going and to ensure that their money is not going to pay off past Baker luxuries? I think that's why they've been giving in such a, an overwhelming way lately is because for the first time we have auditors now and we are making our financials available to the public, not just to donors, to everyone. That has been quite pleasing to the contributors. Jim and Tammy Baker are back in, in South Carolina now. 
you have extended a deadline for them to get out of the home that you plan to sell to raise money. How far does that deadline go? Well, anything reasonable. I think Jim and Tammy know that nobody on this board wants to create an inconvenience for them. We do need to sell those houses at Tiga K. They're like 10 miles or more away from the ministry. And uh, that would raise for us one or two million dollars that could help Is us. Is there a new that. deadline for them to get out? Not uh, as far as I'm concerned. The federal court may deem otherwise the next few days. Jim Baker says that within 30 days he'll either be back at PTL or have a new ministry. Well, I can only speak for Jerry Falwell. I wish he and uh, Mrs. Baker and the family well. We pray for them. I do not know that there's another ministry for them somewhere. God knows that. They know it. And I, I certainly will never stand in their way. He claims to have at least 10,000 signatures on a petition getting him and Tammy back at PTL. Well, I don't uh, have any way of knowing anything about that. I, I know that of the 500,000 supporters of the ministry, a significant percentage of them have contributed the last six weeks, and of the 12, 1,500 staff members at PTL, easily 95% of them are totally su supportive of the new, new administration. I, I seriously doubt there's any serious or uh, or a reasonable contingency out there wanting otherwise. Reverend Jerry Falwell, we thank you thank for joining you. us this morning. Susan? Jim and, and Tammy up Baker the started planning strategy today to take back PTL, and they are looking for help from a higher authority, an authority on the law. Nationally known attorney Melvin Belli arrived with a plan to restore Jim Baker to his ministry. I want to get him back uh, on the air and in his ministry as soon as possible. Belli and his team of lawyers spent four hours conferring with the Bakers going over legal options. When they came out, they gave few details, but made it clear Baker wants PTL back. We gave birth to the vision and the dream of Heritage USA, and our desire and goals are that that ministry continue and that all creditors be paid 100%. And Bell I said the entire PTL fight was unnecessary. Yes, he never should have resigned, and uh, he wasn't uh, told uh, the facts that, that they based the resignation on, and he wasn't told that uh, the lawyer who was there was representing the other side. But at his Lynchburg, Virginia church, Jerry Falwell said he would not give in to the Bakers. Our only interest is to see to it that when that ministry leaves our hands, the present board, that it is spiritually and financially healthy and is not given back to persons like the Bakers who will rape the American public and uh, as they have done in the past. But Belli is predicting victory. No, I win most of my cases and I'm not going to lose this one. The good Lord is going to help me on that. And the Bakers say they plan to remain in their South Carolina home despite the PTL eviction notice and continue the fight to regain the ministry they gave up willingly three months ago. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Tiga K, South Carolina. Faye Baker enjoyed some of her finest hours on television, singing and testifying for millions on the PTL Club. And even though times are harder now, she is still drawn to the cameras. Bruce Hall has more. A tearful Tammy Baker says the family has decided to fight to keep their million-dollar lakefront parsonage and will resist all efforts by Jerry Falwell and the new PTL board to evict them. We've lived there for eight years. It's the only house the kids have known. And once again, the children cry and say, Daddy, please don't let them take our house away from us. The new PTL leadership has ordered the Bakers to vacate the property so it can be sold to help pay the more than $70 million debt that forced PTL to seek bankruptcy protection. At any rate, they have a place to live. They keep coming out and telling about offers from all over the country to go live and set up their ministry. Uh, these are not people that are being um, put on the street by any means. A bidder, Tammy Baker, also charged Falwell aides at sold her children's toys at auction, given away her dog, buried her record albums, and shredded her mail. I would like to say I hope that uh, Jerry Falwell and his family never have to suffer the way that they've made our family suffer. I wake up every morning wishing that they had killed me. And Jim does too. We, it would have been uh, much kinder for them just to have put a bullet in us. And she insisted they would have never allowed PTL to seek bankruptcy protection. And by the way, Jim Baker would have never put PTL into bankruptcy of any kind. He would just never have done that. And we're so sad that that has happened. And what Jim said to Jerry is, Jerry, rather than to put it into bankruptcy, why don't you just let me take it back and raise the money so that we can pay our creditors? 
She said they were now down to their last $37,000. Bye bye. <laughs> but vowed they would be back on television within 30 days. Bruce Hall, CBS News. The contract Atlanta. will reduce class size and raise teachers' pay. The Reverend Jerry Falwell says his TV program, The Old Time Gospel Hour, has fallen on hard times. Falwell is pulling the show from about 50 TV stations because of a $5 million drop in donations, but the show will continue to appear on about 340 other stations around the country. A surprise. And finally, the attention paid television's PTL ministry recently has centered on Jessica Hahn, whose sexual encounter, or whatever it was, with Jim Baker led to his downfall and who decided to tell her side of the story with pictures in Playboy magazine. But now to tell their side of the story, Jim Baker and his wife reached out to touch someone. Peter Van Sant explains how. Fallen TV evangelist Jim and Tammy Baker are raising money again. This time there is no ministry, no programs for the poor that will benefit. The Bakers are using the telephone to reach out to the wallets of their hardcore followers asking them to call a special number that provides a taped message and deposits cash into the Baker's bank account. Hello, this is Tammy Faye. And this is Jim. And we're so glad you called today. The two-minute taped message will cost the average caller $1.85. 25 cents of that will go to the Baker's. A flood of calls is expected, and one spokesman believes the Baker's may earn $100,000 a day. Depending on the amount of um, advertising and promotion that they can do, along with the free publicity they get from press reports, uh, Jim and Tammy may be in the short term uh, generate more call volume than even the pornographers do. Jim and Tammy, I show sure miss them. This TV spot is being broadcast to entice Jim and Tammy believers into calling for the taped message. I wish we could help them somehow. Hello. I'm Mickey Rooney, and I'm also a friend of Jim and Tammy Baker's. You the Bakers say they are using the telephone message to tell their side of the PTL scandal story. But much of the tape is used to promote Tammy's new record album. And I can hardly wait to get it to you. It's, a, it's songs born out of the experience of hurt that we've been through these last eight months. At least 30 different tape messages have already been recorded discussing all aspects of the takeover of the PTL ministry. This gives them an opportunity to reach those people and say, hey, this is Jim and Tammy, we're back again, we're using the phone, call us up, hear what we have to say. And like any good showman, Jim Baker knows he'll have to keep his audience interested in order to make money. At the end of today's tape message, Baker leaves listeners with a soap opera-like cliffhanger. If people will call us back tomorrow, I'm going to tell how this change took place and how literally PTL was stolen from us. See you tomorrow. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Atlanta. And that... Hi, welcome to West 57th. I'm Meredith Vieira. Our first story is about Christian faith and the abuse of it. While Jim and Tammy Baker were making headlines last year, West 57th was investigating two other fundamentalist preachers, William McBurney and Kenneth Berg. Each has been accused in the past of misusing the pulpit and preying on the elderly. Together, some suspect they may be doing it again. Recently, McBurney said he believes America's faith in ministers is returning. The public has a short memory, he said, but some of his followers don't. So help me God, I have never embezzled one penny in my whole life. And I don't know how to make it any plainer than that. He is a guest of kings and presidents and government leaders. He's authored over 400 books. It seems ironic now, but in 1980, Reverend William Stewart McBurney came to the defense of fellow minister Jim Baker. Baker's legal problems were just beginning. So were McBurney's, but no one knew it. The only way we're going to bring all that sort of thing, that is harassment, to an end, is to elect people to office who are godly people. And then we're going to see an end to this. Five years later, the courts ruled McBurney had defrauded his followers through bad loans. The judge said McBurney never intended to pay the money back. As much as $4 million is said to be still missing. McBurney had built a religious kingdom in Glendale, California. Besides the church, there was a graduate school of theology 
and a host of church organizations. To finance his projects, McBurney asked his followers to open not only the good book, but their checkbooks as well. The court ruled he diverted some of those loans for his personal gain. McBurney left the pulpit, but he continues to preach over the airwaves. We've got to repent to change And to our profess his innocence. I am an absolutely honest person. I would not jip a person out of a penny. The other day, uh, I found uh, in a, a seat in a restaurant, 60 cents, somebody had dropped out of their pocket. I took it to the cashier, left it with them. Why? Because I can't live with taking other people's things. He owes me 39000 right now, plus interest. $39,000 plus interest? Mm -hmm. Blanche Reese is typical of those who loaned McBurney money, elderly with a small nest egg and a huge amount of faith. The Voice of Americanism presents Dr. Stuart McBurney. She first heard the preacher on his daily radio broadcast, Voice of Americanism. If you trust me, right today. And we'll send McBurney is still on the air asking for cash, while Blanche is still waiting for hers, three years after she and others won the civil suit against him. Did McBurney take away your life savings? Yes, he did. And now I'm having health problems. This past year, uh, from the concern and worry and whatnot, and I try to do the right thing, but I failed somewhere along the line by believing in someone that, that I had faith in as a minister. He has wrenched the faith away from a lot of my clients. They wanted to believe. They wanted to believe in him. They wanted to believe in the things that he was talking about. And now they don't know what to believe. Chris Trufus has dedicated most of his law practice to tracking down the money due Blanche and his other clients. He claims McBurney has avoided paying them by using every legal trick in the book from declaring bankruptcy on church organizations to hiding personal assets. I have tried to find monies held in Dr. McBurney's name. Uh, at one point, I went to a bank uh, and uh, with various uh, court orders and located some 22 bank accounts where monies had been shifted from one to the other and back and forth, all of them closed. Are you concerned about your own personal assets being attached? Nope, I have none. What do you mean you have none? I have none. I have no assets. I do not own a building in this world. The classic mode of a con man is that he uses other people and fronts, and you never see the real person. And just as you'll never get a straight answer, you'll never find assets in his name. Dr. Burke, I ain't gonna pay for that all the people you swindle. But we may have stumbled upon some of those assets, inadvertently led there by this man. McBurney's old friend, Reverend Kenneth Berg. Before we explain the connection between the two, it's important to understand just who Berg is. He's a convicted con man who's built a career upon swindling the elderly that spans 20 years, 12 states, and hundreds of victims like these. I've never seen nobody as slick as Berg was. He was just really the slickest thing you've ever seen. He's a con man, the biggest one I've ever, you know, I've never known anybody just like him. These people found out about Berg the hard way. They invested in one of his retirement homes in Mobile, Alabama. It was vintage Berg. He took the resident's savings and then ran the place into the ground. But authorities here were convinced it would be Berg's last scam when they finally convicted him of securities fraud in 1984. Alabama prosecutor Lee Hale said he never thought Berg could get back in the business. I think he'll spend the rest of his life behind bars if he ever did again, because we just can't allow that type of person who poses that type of risk to be able to run the streets of anywhere in this country. Why do you think he preyed on the elderly? They're easy. The easiest uh, people in this country to prey upon, other than little children, are the elderly. And the elderly have money while little children don't. Alabama sentenced Berg to three years in prison, but he was released on early probation, thanks in part to the good word of his old friend, William McBurney. I don't suppose that I get anywhere saying this, but it's God's truth. I was trying to be helpful to him as he rehabilitated himself. He came out here and he said, can you help me? I said, what do you want to do? I said, uh, I don't know that I could recommend you to any church. Well, no. He said, uh, 
perhaps I can do something in the field of real estate. McBurney claims he lost track of Berg, but we found the minister last summer building retirement homes in Southern California. Berg was working for a company called Great West Facilities, and it had just completed construction of its first project, the Princess Regency. When we checked the corporation papers, we discovered that Great West's president and CEO was none other than William McBurney. The company's secretary was Mrs. McBurney. A few weeks before the apartments went up for sale last June, McBurney had everything transferred over to a William W. Watkins. What do you know about the Princess Regency? What is it? I can't think right now. You don't know anything about the Princess Regency? No. Have you ever heard of it? Not that I know of. It's a retirement village, uh, it's sort of condominiums, retirement condominiums. Where? In Paris, California. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. Do you know anything about Great West facilities? I uh, know that there is such a thing, but I don't know anything about um, uh, what they are. You were once listed as the president and CEO of Great West facilities. Do you remember that? Well, I certainly do not remember that. President? Of course not. President, CEO of Great West Facilities, which essentially was responsible for building the Princess Regency. And shortly before the grand opening, you had the papers changed, and that title was turned over to W.W. W. Watkins. Now you know what I'm talking about? Yes, now I do. OK, can you tell me what you know about it? No, I don't know much about it. it Despite uh, what McBurney told us, we, we spotted project. him at the Princess Regency during its grand opening. June McBurney was there, too, trying to sell the condos to seniors. The minister says he has no personal assets, but that's not what his wife told our hidden camera. We founded the company. We have all our money here. Well, of course, I don't know what she said, and, and she doesn't, uh, she can answer that, whatever she said. She's a very honest person. I've never known her to deceive in the slightest. She can't deceive. It's impossible for her. We don't have any money in it. As for McBurney's connection with Kenneth Berg... Do you have any dealings with him? Over the years, I've had a lot of dealings with him. And how about now? No, not a bit. No connection whatsoever. But when we called Great West Facilities, we were told Berg was a vice president. He drove a company car, and the phone number for the Princess Regency was in his wife's name. Berg hasn't mentioned any of this to federal officials, even though he was ordered to notify them if he ever got involved with retirement homes again. He wouldn't talk with us either, but Mrs. McBurney did. He's a, a consultant. Well, I don't know what she said, but I can guarantee you this that an advisor of his enormous experience has a lot to share. Who would want, as a consultant, a man who has three felony convictions for taking away hundreds of thousands of dollars of uh, money from innocent elderly? What kind of a consultant can that man be? All of this has come as a shock to Berg's victims in Alabama. We just saw Mr. Berg in California. You did. Oh. And we have reason to believe that he is a consultant for a retirement complex out there. How awful. <laughs> the reaction in California to McBurney's involvement is less shock than anger. How could he be involved in a new development, a new project? Where did he get the financing to do that if he has nothing for the creditors who've been waiting 10 years to be repaid? If McBurney's money was in the Regency, it's probably not there now. Shortly after our interview, the retirement home suddenly shut down. Great West Facilities has also disappeared, its headquarters replaced by a medical office. Hello? Blanche Reese is still waiting for her money. Justice delayed is justice denied. And another year with the elderly, and you have fewer plaintiffs, you have fewer creditors. You're a year further down the road from your obligations, and maybe they'll go away. That's exactly what he's hoping. Three of the people have already passed away. And I feel that he has wronged many people. And I just pray to God every night that the Lord will cause him to feel and realize how much pain and, and hurt that he's caused all of us. And I'm not alone. It wasn't something where I was taking advantage of uh, people's credulity. God forbid.
That makes you a religious con man, and I am no such thing. Well, how do you react when people say, well, that's exactly what McBurney is, well, a very smart con man? Well, how do you react in a thing like that if you know in your heart that it's not true? You live with it, and you bear the terrible burden of it, and you read those newspaper accounts, and you cringe, and you hold up your head, and you go on with your work to the best of your knowledge. That is exactly how I operate. If I were a con man, I would have disappeared a long time ago. McBurney has far from disappeared. Shortly after our interview, he began denouncing CBS over the radio and is now soliciting funds to fight what he calls the evil plot against him. As for Kenneth Berg, he may be headed east. Sources near Kansas City say he showed up recently, put a cross on top of a house, and dubbed it the Little Brown Church shooting her in the throat. Now some names making news this morning. Defrocked PTL Minister Jim Baker told reporters outside a South Carolina courtroom that he never used church money to buy a houseboat and two Rolls Royces. Baker was in court to fight a $52 million lawsuit that accuses him of misappropriation of church funds. Shirley Temple Black. Regardless of how the Swaggart story ends, today's developments already have sent shockwaves through the world of evangelical religion and through the world of politics as well. Richard Roth has the story. In 20 years, the electronic church has become one of America's biggest growth industries. Christian televangelism is a $2 billion a year empire of broadcasting and real estate, built on a foundation of faith by a handful of ministers sharing a unique kind of charisma, the ability to excite people, to create confidence, and raise cash. But experts today say the latest trouble in the TV church is bound to raise a serious new question. Is the electronic Garden of Eden filled with bad apples? It's just very difficult for people who have, uh, in, in many cases, sacrificed uh, to support these ministries to be asked to come back and trust us and send us your money, uh, at least for a period of time until there's some sense of, of, of trust re-established re by those ministers that, ministries that have not been, been affected. Before Jimmy Swaggart, there was Jim Baker, forced to resign last year as head of the $129 million a year South Carolina ministry called PTL. He had been wickedly manipulated into a sexual encounter with a church secretary, he said. And before Jim Baker, there was Oral Roberts, who last year was telling his TV congregation that God was calling him back, an invitation that could be forestalled by $8 million in contributions. Jerry Falwell today called Swaggart's admission of sin a tragedy, adding, many sincere people have had their faith shattered. We shouldn't stereotype all because of the mistakes of a few, uh, and that uh, while we all have uh, feet of clay, we are all sinners and have fallen short of the glory of God, as the scriptures say. But the implications go beyond religion to politics. Campaigning today in South Carolina, presidential hopeful Pat Robertson tried to make the point he's so far removed from his own televangelizing past He's not kept up with Swaggart's troubles. I really don't have any, I have not any thought on it one way or the other. I'm, I'm just sorry, and uh, I don't think it's, uh, I'm, I'm running so hard for president, I really haven't had a chance to think much about it. But others have, and say there could be a direct effect on Robertson's campaign. To survive as a viable candidate, said one analyst tonight, Robertson needs distance from his past as a religious broadcaster. And new troubles in any branch of the TV church he left don't help. Susan? Richard Roth, thank you. Coming up next on tonight's CBS Evening in this News. Country, a strange twist in the case of evangelist Jim Baker. He now admits he never had financial backing from a mysterious Greek tycoon in his bid to regain control of the PTL ministry. Baker says the reports of a tycoon first appeared in the news media and he simply went along with them. He also says he doesn't know where he'll get the millions needed to buy back PTL. Baker's admission came after CBS affiliate WBTV in Charlotte, North Carolina, disclosed that a key figure in the buyback plan is Louis Fahakis, who is served prison terms for forgery, counterfeiting, and mail fraud. But the man who brought Baker and Fahakis together says that shouldn't matter. I, I think that everybody, you know, this is the thing about the Christian ministry that you must remember, that we're a very forgiving group, that if somebody's made mistakes, we don't mind that. It, it matters who they are today. You can find a record on just about anybody. Maybe the record might not be criminal, but you got a record of sinning. Baker says he's not worried about being cheated since he hasn't given Pahakas any money. Acts as if Too it's, very quote, scared of the truth. 
Jim and Tammy Baker are moving their television ministry to Orlando, Florida. The Jim and Tammy show will be taped in a nearly deserted shopping center close to the new house the Bakers are renting. Jim Baker says Orlando is the crossroads of the world and the Bakers hope to raise money to build a new religious theme park nearby. I think Kathleen and Mark, there's already a theme park around. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Jim and Tammy Baker went back on television yesterday and called the last two years a holocaust. The Bakers made clear who they thought was behind their troubles. I think the devil said, this is it. I think I've got to smash Jim and Tammy Baker. Well, you know, Jim, too many marriages were being put back together. Too many babies were being saved. Too many street people, their lives were being totally turned around. Too many people were getting saved. I think the devil was just angry. <laughs> I did too. Just two days before the Bakers returned to the air, the judge who presided over the PTL bankruptcy proceedings retired from the federal bench. It was Judge Rufus Reynolds who ordered the Bakers to pay back $7.7 million to the PTL. He also approved the sale of the PTL's assets to a Canadian businessman. Judge Reynolds joins us live from his home in Greensboro, North Carolina. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. <clears throat> 42 years on the bench. Had you ever seen a case before like the Bakers? No. I hope I'll never see another one. What was it about the case well, that... Well, uh, it was so emotional. Everybody seemed to be interested in it. Not only the money, but uh, I don't know what the reason was. I'm sure it wasn't sex, but it must have been sex and religion. What, but everybody was interested. Did, did Jim Baker impress you as a... Did, you, did, he, did he seem to you to be a man of God? Well... <clears throat> I would say yes and no. Yes, he, had, he was very influential on people. I think he did a wonderful idea of building a Christian city, did a very fine work, but the problem was handling the money. Uh, he didn't handle the money in a very good business-like way. It uh, felt like it was all his money, and whatever he wanted to do with it, he could do with it. That's what he could do with it. He uh, testified in front of you. What was, what was your impression of him? Well, of course, uh, he was speaking from the business angle, and he's certainly not a very good businessman. And uh, his uh, testimony, I read about uh, 2,000 pages of testimony and two weeks of uh, live testimony in court and thousands of pages of documents. And I went in the hearing with a clear mind, but I came out uh, feeling that uh, he had very little defense to it, almost none. It was uh, non-impressive as to what he had to say about it. What, what did they do with all of that money? Well, they just wasted a lot of it. Uh, one example, he employed a plane, chartered a plane for $130,000, just to take him out to California. Kept it out there two weeks, things like that. He just, money that you wouldn't think about spending, he did, and uh, document after document, receipt after receipt were presented before me, and after seeing all this, you could just kind of cringe. Why take religious money collected for one purpose and throw it away for another? That, that's the whole picture. How'd you come up with the figure of $7.7 .7 million? Well, I took about what he had. This is in a, this is a matter of record. I'm not speaking out. I have nothing else. I must say I have nothing else to do with any bankruptcy cases. I'm out completely. I can speak freely. But from the record, 50-some pages of my findings, you'll find that he took uh, money for one purpose, which is foreign excess. His salaries were foreign excess. He took <clears throat> all kinds of bonuses and uh, the bonuses were never approved by the board but written in afterwards afterthought and uh, the way the money was just wasted you see uh, Jim and Tammy are back on the air again yes, right now yes they have they have they'll appeal to a certain group all these ministers have something good they're here to stay <clears throat> but my idea is we're going to have to control them more I think Congress should pass some new laws which put some teeth in the accountability. That's the weakness. You're not going to do away with the ministries. They do a real good job in their field. A lot of people are not going to church. They just don't dress up for the dress parade and hit these people who cannot get out or do not go to church and are very effective. But 
We need to protect the consumer. This is only a consumer item. When they get on the air and beg for money, uh, I consider them along with any other commodity. Therefore, I think Congress should immediately pass a very strict accounting ability so that when you send your dollar in <coughs> to a ministry, you know it's well spent. It's Judge, going for what it says. Judge Rufus Reynolds, we thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you lots. Righto. It is 15 minutes past the hour of faith. Harry, next, Aaron Moriarty on a new system to predict personal bankruptcy. And still ahead, Ricky Schroeder. He and his roles are all grown up. Okay, okay, nice this morning, meeting. we're devoting an hour to a subject we Americans are examining as never before, the ethics crisis. A presidential commission on ethics is putting the final touches on a report it is scheduled to present to the White House tomorrow. More and more, we're wondering if cheating is the American way. As Americans, we like to think of ourselves as honest and decent people. We cherish the legend of Washington's cherry tree and celebrate honest Abe Lincoln. People have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. But over the past two decades, we've had reason to question that image. It started with Watergate. And sometimes, it seems, it hasn't stopped since. Even clean Jimmy Carter suffered with allegations of sleaze against Burt Lance. And during the eight years of the Reagan administration, more than 100 officials left office while under investigation or indictment. I am impressed that policy was driven by a series of lies. <clears throat> lies to the Iranians, lies to the Central Intelligence Agency, lies to the Congress, and lies to the American people. George Bush told us a new breeze was blowing, but within days, it was revealed that Bush's new ethics chief, a longtime aide, was collecting two salaries, one inside and one outside the government. I used to be a pretty good scotch drinker. Bush Defense Secretary designate John Tower has had to defend himself against charges of drinking and womanizing. I have sinned against you, my lord. But government isn't the only institution having problems with ethics. Within the past two years, we've seen two well-known TV preachers destroyed by sex scandals. Last summer at the Olympics, champion sprinter Ben Johnson was stripped of his gold medal for illegal drug use. And in the midst of an historic economic boom, dozens of Wall Street traders have been busted for insider trading. Conclusion, Americans must be less good than we used to be. The country is in the midst of moral decay. Former prosecutor Rudolph Giuliani doesn't think so. To a very large extent, what is happening to us is we are finding out today much more about what is wrong with us than we did 20, 30, 40, or 100 years ago. There are considerably more investigations by the government and by the press into areas that maybe would just sporadically be touched 10, 15, 20 years ago, 100 years ago. But many ethicists claim there is a problem, and it stems, they say, from the fact that no one is teaching values anymore, that schools are afraid they may trespass on religion, that the media seems to prefer villains to heroes, and that mom and dad are just too busy. I think there is a sense in which we expect others to uh, provide the values for our children. Uh, we expect uh, government to, to somehow regulate good behavior in business. We expect the voter to regulate good behavior in government, there is a tendency to expect everybody else to manage morality other than, than ourselves. Get another 50 for sale. No what our culture does seem to be teaching us is that greed and success are more important than honesty and fairness. We've destroyed our mythos in terms of uh, leadership, and all we're left with is the mythos of money and the mythos of raw power, sort of stripped from any illusions that there could be a moral center to it. The moral mess that fills the media and clogs our consciences leaves us with a choice of being chastened or challenged. This is a problem that has persisted throughout history. And we are, for the first time, really confronting it honestly, straight, you know, seeing it, because there aren't any holes that are barred any longer. Now, how we react to that is the real challenge. It's 14 minutes past the hour. Next, a man who is dedicating his life to advancing ethics.
I'm Sharon Gless. Alcoholism is a woman's issue. Women are still judged by special standards where drinking is concerned. A woman with an alcohol problem may be put down, turned off, or even protected from help and information. But the disease of alcoholism doesn't have any attitudes about women. It hits us just as hard, harder in some ways. Find out why alcoholism is a woman's issue. Ask NCA for their facts about women drinkers and the danger signals. Call 1-800-NCA-CALL. America was born of the sea and grew along her rivers and lakes. Ships brought her the goods and people to build a nation. A few of these great sailing ships and paddle boats remain to keep alive for us the lore and skills of another age. But like other valuable things from our past, they must be cared for and maintained. Lend a hand in protecting our national maritime heritage. Support maritime preservation in your community. Don't give up the ships. children at all ages from all places unfortunately some kids aren't loved kids like these they're abused they're battered they're driven into the streets some become prostitutes drug addicts alcoholics and today kids like these are statistics because today they're dead Covenant House helps with food clothing sanctuary and most of all someone to talk to call our nine line 1-800-999-9999 Michael Josephson was a lawyer, professor, and businessman. He gave up those pursuits to take on one, the pursuit of ethics. In 1985, he founded the nonprofit Joseph and Edna Josephson Institute for the Advancement of Ethics. And Michael Josephson joins us this morning live from our Los Angeles bureau. You know, why did you decide to give up all of the, the profit, the money, and you go out all around the country? A lot of your speeches are for nonprofit, uh, for, to government agencies. Why do you do it? Well, I guess nothing's better than being a stand-up philosopher, and I love it. I, uh, when I was in business, I was successful and I was making money. Here, I'm trying to, to change things a little bit. It's like that movie Network where they say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And the idea is to, to look at our society and see if we can make a positive difference. And I've been really uh, excited about the fact that we've met with major, major leaders and have been making a difference. Michael, do you think we're in a state of moral disarray? Oh, I think we have a real problem, but I don't know that it's worse than it ever has been. I mean, you don't have to be sick to get better. I think we have two conflicting things going on. Institutionally, our ethics are probably higher than they ever were in terms of journalism, in terms of politics. But individually, we're certainly no better than we were. And the mismatch between what we're demanding and expecting of people institutionally and the way they're behaving makes it much more glaring, uh, our ethical shortcomings. Are some of our ethical problems a result of the lack of instilled values? In part, I think there's no question that this coming generation, and incidentally, I think that uh, we're going to experience even worse problems in another 10 or 15 years when the existing generation takes over the reins of power, because I think they're less anchored to values than even the present generation is. I think there's been a tendency to replace fundamental notions of selflessness and community and achievement with uh, more narrow materialistic notions. I know you have a, a code of conduct, a three-part process uh, in being fair and ethical. Tell me, tell me what those three parts are. Well, basically, we think ethical decision-making consists of three basic things. First of all, ethical consciousness, which is an awareness of the ethical implications of your conduct, to think about who has a stake in what you are going to decide. Second is the notion of ethical commitment, and that's the strength of your own desire to do the right thing. And the third is what we call ethical competency, which is your ability to do the right thing without throwing yourself on the hand grenade, so to speak, and sacrificing everything uh, that, that you want to achieve. But you can actually violate an ethical principle, can't you, uh, in order to attain a higher moral understanding? 
Well, of course, there is the problem. Most of us are ultimately what we call consequentialists, which ultimately means that we will say the end justifies the means sometimes. But those are relatively rare. If the Nazis come up to you and say, where is Anne Frank? Most people would say it would be ethical to lie uh, or lie to the terrorists. But too often, I think, in the professions, we use that as an excuse. And we pretend as if there's some moral imperative to achieve our purposes when all we're really pursuing is self-interest. What's today's most pressing ethical problem? Well, there are, of course, many, but I sense that the most pressing is a, is a loss of the American idealism, the kind of notion that we can and should be better than we're inclined to be. And this cynicism kind of generates and feeds on itself, so soon we begin to think we're ethical as long as we're no worse than the other guy. And I think we need to have this idealism that we ought to be better than we are. Well, let me go through the uh, top eth ethics problems in a couple industries. Let's start with journalism. You said it's better off now than it was before. Well, institutionally it is. Certainly the la conflicts of interest are regulated much more than it ever was. Journalists are better trained than they ever were before. And in many ways, they're much more accurate. On the other hand, there are two pressures that I think that are creating serious problems. One is what I call a kind of green beret journalism where anything goes. There doesn't seem to be any clear standards anymore as to what's proper and what's not proper. And the second major pressure that's happening in journalism is an enormous bottom lineism where it is being used more as a product than ever before. And as a result, one sacrifices the higher interests of producing the conscience, the teacher, the uh, watchdog, and simply is pandering or heraldizing most of journalism. The biggest problems in the field of law. Well, in law, what happens is lawyers become unaccountable. They believe that anything's legitimate in fighting for their client, and that allows them to do certain things, I think, that in their personal lives they wouldn't do. Secondly, lawyers are becoming more and more businessified, if you will. They're becoming big businesses, and their major problems in billing and the relationships between client and lawyer are, are dissipating. The biggest problem in the field of education? Well, I think the biggest problem in education is that educators are not walking their talk. They're not setting the example they talk about. Universities who are involved in all kinds of corrupt recruiting scandals regarding sports. or It reminds me of the story of the father who comes home and sees his son with a beautiful set of magic markers, and he said, where'd you get that? And the son says, I took it from school. I really needed it. And the father said, are you allowed to do that? He said, no. Well, we're going back to school, and we're going to return them. If you needed markers so badly, why didn't you tell me I would have taken them from the office? Biggest problem in the field of business, if you can quickly, Michael. Business is competition, excess competition and a fear of the Wall Street journalism, uh, the, the Wall Street taking over uh, psychology, which is making people think on 90-day cycles rather than long term. Fascinating. Michael Josephson, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. It's now 22 after. Harry? Still ahead, more on cheating the American way. Watergate. Conspirator Jeb Stuart Magruder, Stonewall Congress. Now he's preaching higher values. Today by a federal grand jury looking into the multi-million dollar religious empire known as PTL and its founder, Jim Baker. The results, after a 16-month investigation, the jury indicted Baker, his top aide, and two other associates. Peter Van Sant reports. And now, here's your host, PTL president, Jim Baker. He was the greatest money-raising TV evangelist of all time, a man who could summon millions of dollars through emotional appeals. Tonight, Jim Baker stands indicted for allegedly misusing that money, charged with 24 counts of fraud and conspiracy to defraud the public. Fraud in the name of religion is still fraud. Abuse in the name of religion is still abuse. That's what we're learning from PTL. And Tammy Faye. I think the most exciting thing in all the world is our lifetime partnership. Oh, Jim, I do too. Those partnerships are at the center of Baker's indictment. More than $158 million were raised through the partnerships for construction projects that the grand jury concluded were never built. I would say 95% of what's being said is lies. And I can document. I keep saying, what have we done? What in the world have we done? I can't figure out what we've done wrong. 
In his makeshift church yesterday, oh, Baker said he would not get a fair trial and that if it would help Christianity, he would, quote, get a gun and blow my head off. The PTL Television Network presents Jim and Jimmy. The PTL ministry became headline news when Baker resigned in March of 1987 after admitting a sexual encounter with Jessica Hahn. He is not a preacher going to jail for 40 years. He's a thief who has taken hundreds of millions of dollars. If convicted on all 24 counts, Baker faces a maximum sentence of 120 years in prison and a $6 million fine. Baker still claims he will return to television with a new Jim and Tammy show and new appeals for more money. But this time, Baker faces the real possibility that he'll be preaching from prison. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Charlotte, North Carolina. A dramatic development today in the trial of a New York man charged with beating to death the six-year-old girl he helped raise. Richard Schlesinger is covering that case. In a surprise move, lawyers for accused child killer Joel Steinberg tried to change his plea to not guilty because of insanity. They based their effort on the testimony of Steinberg's ex-lover, Hedda Nussbaum, who told the court Steinberg was unconcerned as six-year-old Lisa, the child they had illegally adopted, lay in a coma. Her perception of what's taking place that night is that everything is quite serious, that the condition is serious. This perception is it's all quite trivial. If she's correct, that's nuts. That's what I'm saying, quite simple, Judge. In graphic testimony last week, Nussbaum described how Steinberg went to dinner as Lisa lay comatose. According to Nussbaum, Steinberg's advice to her was to breathe with Lisa and be in harmony with her. What she has described are the actions of two totally crazy people. Some legal experts were surprised by today's motion. It shows a weakness in the defense case. It's a desperation act. The judge dismissed the effort to change Steinberg's plea for now, but said he might reconsider it in the future, adding yet another twist to the trial that has captivated New York for more than a week. Richard Schlesinger, CBS News, New York. Paul Kirk is stepping out as Democratic National Chairman. He announced today he will not seek a new term. Kirk's departure is expected to result. Columbus has been set up. Opening arguments are scheduled to begin tomorrow in the fraud and conspiracy trial of TV preacher Jim Baker, former head of the PTL Club. Bruce Hall has our report. And now, here's your host, PTL President Jim Baker. For years, Jim Baker's loyal audience showered his television ministry with more than $100 million a year in contributions. Baker goes on trial tomorrow in a North Carolina courtroom, charged with diverting more than $4 million in ministry money to support a lavish lifestyle that included palatial homes, expensive cars, and even an air-conditioned doghouse. What happened to Jim Baker is that, that he simply became so powerful within that organization that uh, he felt he could do as he pleased. The devil wants to paralyze you. Prosecutors are expected to portray Baker as a modern-day Elmer Gantry who practiced fraud in the name of religion. What we're talking about here is a landmark case. It's a watershed on this issue. Two of Baker's aides already have been found guilty of income tax evasion and a third pleaded guilty, getting a reduced sentence of eight years in return for agreeing to testify against Baker. A judge-imposed gag order means Baker cannot talk about the trial, but his wife Tammy remains defiant, using their Florida-based talk show to defend him. I will not bow down. Praise God. Praise God. Jim Baker did not steal money from PTL. Praise God. Jim Baker's remaining supporters believe the trial will give him a chance to clear his name. If he is not successful, Baker faces a fine of $5 million and up to 120 years in prison. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Charlotte. Former Georgia Congressman Pat Swindle will be sentenced tomorrow for lying to a grand jury about his knowledge of a scheme to launder drug money. When Jim Swindle Baker's PTL empire collapsed a couple of years ago, he was not alone. Some, not all, but some other TV evangelists also found themselves on shaky ground, accused of various improprieties. But as correspondent Richard Threlkeld tells us in his report, that did not doom America's electronic church. It is thriving once again. Every day, tens of millions of Americans faithfully tune in their TV preachers. 
but their faith has been sorely tried the past couple of years since some of their favorites have started showing up instead on the evening news, accused of one sin or another, or admitting it. I have sinned against you, my Lord. Sex, money, power, the scandals were a setback for televangelism, but only a temporary setback. Amen. Hallelujah. Televangelism is on the road to recovery with a whole new crop of video clergy. At least a dozen TV preachers around the country have picked up some of the audience that deserted the bigger names who fell from grace. And some of the old familiar names aren't doing so badly either. Pat Robertson's presidential campaign never got off the ground, but his 700 Club is now boasting its best rating ever. Jerry Falwell folded his moral majority, but his TV ministry netted a record $135 million last year. Even Oral Roberts, who had to close his hospital because it was too expensive, is still grossing $2 million a month. How come so many of the true believers who were so let down by a few of the TV preachers are still giving so generously to others? If a person is jilted by one person in their love life, doesn't mean they do away with the love. They just find a place where their love is secure. The people keep giving because it's not for us to judge the ministers. God will judge the ministers. It's our business to stand up to hell. But what if the TV ministers insist they're just doing God's will and forget they're only human? The ministers get into a position where they are accustomed to saying, God told me to do this. They are not accustomed to being challenged. They are not accountable to anyone. And almost any of us are likely to fall under that sort of situation. So the televangelist associations are trying to enforce some reforms to keep their ministers from succumbing to the temptations of life in the fast lane. It's a matter of survival. If they do not solve the problem of self-regulation, then we're going to see government regulation and we're going to see increasing uh, disillusionment among, uh, among viewers. Which could happen if any more TV preachers get carried away by that business about God helping those who help themselves. Richard Threlkeld, CBS News, New York. The founder of the PTL ministry today said this Christmas time is, quote, basically, to be very, very honest, a sad day for me. He made that comment after he and three former aides appeared at a court hearing that followed months of rumors and charges of financial hijinks. Bruce Hall has our report. How y'all doing? <laughs> in battle, TV evangelist Jim Baker was in federal court today. To hear charges, he diverted more than $5 million from PTL contributors so he could live a life of luxury. And I am confident that if we can have a fair trial and due process, we will win uh, this case. U.S. Magistrate Paul Taylor lifted Baker's passport, restricted travel to North and South Carolina, and set bond at $50,000. Jim and Tammy Baker are back to making public appearances, signing Bibles for loyal followers. They have rented a skating rink to hold weekly church services, usually attracting about 300 people. All of us working together have been able to do something on, on a shoestring. But the Bakers are apparently not living on a shoestring. They are staying in this huge North Carolina mansion and are making plans to return to television. Baker is not the only evangelist having trouble with the government. The Internal Revenue Service has ordered audits at Jerry Falwell's Liberty University, Pat Robertson, CBN Network, and Oral Roberts Ministries. Baker is expected to go to trial in June or July, and his attorney says the case could take up to six months. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Charlotte. A trail of sex, scandal, and sensationalism amid claims of piety led to a North Carolina courtroom today. After months of steamy accusations, television evangelist Jim Baker went before the bar to answer charges of fraud and conspiracy. Bruce Hall reports. Two years after losing his religious empire in a sex and money scandal, PTL founder Jim Baker entered a federal courthouse today seeking a jury of 12 believers. Our faith is in God. <laughs> All 70 prospective jurors questioned today said they were familiar with Jim Baker, but tonight Judge Robert Potter is close to selecting the jury. That jury will decide whether Baker defrauded PTL followers by diverting more than $4 million in ministry money. Baker's wife, Tammy Fay, stayed home in Florida today and was on the air pleading for divine intervention for her husband. We need you to uh, really pray for us. Yes. 
There are such terrible things going on in Charlotte, North Carolina right now. Last month, two of Baker's aides were found guilty of tax evasion. Another pleaded guilty to fraud and agreed to testify against his boss. There is an overwhelming public consensus that we need accountability from people like Jim Baker. During their heyday, Jim and Tammy Baker welcomed six million people a year to PTL's Christian theme park. Their vast television audience annually donated more than $100 million to the ministry. How come you don't mind if Johnny Carson gets five or $10 million a year, but if a television evangelist makes a few thousand dollars, he's a ripoff? It was excessive, it was utterly inappropriate, and it was hypocritical. Prosecutors are expected to present old videotapes of Jim Baker to establish a pattern of deception and fraud. Baker's attorneys won't reveal their strategy, but Baker is confident he can convince the jury he did nothing wrong. Where's Hope you all have a good day. Right, let's get over here. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Charlotte. Authorities said at least 15 people were slightly injured today by the explosion of what appeared to be a tear gas bomb in a package mailed to NAACP regional headquarters in Atlanta. The bomb emitted yellowish caustic smoke when it exploded as the secretary opened the hat box size package. The air conditioning system rapidly took the smoke throughout the two-story building, which houses some medical offices. After months of sensational charges, the fraud and conspiracy trial of television evangelist Jim Baker got underway today. Defense and prosecution painted two very different pictures of the PTL founder. Bruce Hall reports from Charlotte, North Carolina. A confident, smiling Jim Baker entered a federal courthouse today to face 24 charges he defrauded PTL followers of more than $4 million to support his lavish lifestyle. Have a nice day. Thank you. In opening arguments, prosecutor Jerry Miller portrayed Baker as a greedy, money-hungry showman who practiced fraud disguised as religion. Miller told jurors Baker enjoyed a life of excess, spending $100,000 in ministry money to charter a jet just to take his clothes to California. Miller also said Baker kept $100 worth of cinnamon rolls in his room just because he liked the smell. However, Baker's attorney George Davis said the evangelist was a creative genius whose behavior was not fraudulent. Davis said there were no restrictions placed on the money donated by Christian-minded people. Davis conceded Baker had a sexual incident with former church secretary Jessica Hahn, but insisted he did not take part in the $265,000 payoff to her. However, the government's first witness, former Baker aide David Taggart, said the evangelist was fully involved in the decision to pay Hahn. My heart is with my husband today. Baker's wife Tammy, appearing on their Florida-based television show today, predicted her husband would be acquitted. Don't give up, honey. We're on the brink of a miracle, and God is going to outlast our storm. Outside the Charlotte Federal Courthouse is a carnival-like atmosphere, but inside the stakes are very high for Baker, who could get up to 120 years in prison and a $5 million fine if found guilty on all counts. Baker's biggest worry may be the testimony of his former top aide, Richard Dortch. Dortch pleaded guilty to reduce charges in return for testimony against Baker. He's the inside man. If there's going to be a star witness, it will certainly be Richard Dortch. When you give your $1,000 gift, you receive... Prosecutors will also center on Baker's pitch for lifetime partnerships, which promised free lodging at his Christian retreat for those who contributed. Prosecutors claim those promised rooms were overbooked or were never built. The judge asked us not to comment. Thank you. The trial is expected to last a month. Then the jury of six men and six women, all of whom describe themselves as churchgoers, will have to decide whether Jim Baker will walk free or spend the rest of his life doing his preaching in prison. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Charlotte. One time Georgia the Congressman of TV Slump. evangelist Jim Baker today, there were allegations the Baker's monthly electric bill sometimes ran up to $2,000 because the swimming pool was kept heated to 90 degrees and that Baker once spent $105,000 just to fly clothing and other belongings cross-country on a private jet. We have more on today's revelations from Bruce Hall. In a packed North Carolina courtroom, former aide David Taggart said Jim Baker complained that he lived a shabby life compared to fellow evangelists while continuing to accept millions in bonuses and other compensation. In an attempt to downplay Baker's lavish lifestyle, 
Defense attorneys asked Taggart if Baker voted against or left the room every time the board of directors considered a bonus for him. Taggart's answer, yes. But prosecutors in redirect examination asked, did Jim Baker ever refuse or turn back any of those bonuses once they were approved? Taggart, not that I am aware of. Those bonuses for Baker and his wife Tammy totaled more than three million dollars. I think it set the wrong tone for the organization. In addition to being a cash drain on the organization, it set a, a lavish, a opulent lifestyle that PTL really couldn't afford. In court, the government continues to portray Baker's PTL empire as a kingdom of excess, with the evangelist and his family living like royalty. Probably 99 percent, or at least 95 percent, of what you hear about Jim and Tammy Baker and PTL and Heritage USA these next few weeks is going to be nothing but lies or things taken out of contents made to look like something that it wasn't. A judge's order prevents Baker from talking about the trial, but leaving court today, Baker made it clear who owns the expensive car he has been taking to and from the courthouse. By the way, this is my lawyer's car. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Hall, CBS News, Charlotte. In revised figures, Richard Wagner, CBS News, Johannesburg. Some of the items in our daybook this Tuesday, the 5th of September. Just days after Jim Baker was confined for psychiatric examination, a court ruling is expected on whether Baker's trial can continue. Teacher strikes are spreading into California and Idaho as more schools are scheduled to begin the fall term today. And two Soviet cosmonauts are going through their final preparations for launching tonight. The cosmonauts are to reopen the Soviet's Mir space station. Back now to Harry and Faith. Time to go to the weather map once again. Mark McEwen is here with the latest on her. Former President Reagan could be headed home from the hospital tomorrow, just four days after surgery to remove a blood clot from his brain. Mr. Reagan is resting comfortably at a hospital in Rochester, Minnesota, where he received hundreds of get well wishes. Doctors now say this was Mr. Reagan's second such blood clot, the first healed without surgery. Some of the items in our daybook this Monday, September 11th. Evangelist Jim Baker returns to court as his PTL fraud and conspiracy trial resumes. A task force on the nation's aging airliners will call for mandatory safety work on older DC-10s and other McDonnell Douglas jets. And Zsa, Zsa Gabor goes on trial. When her Rolls Royce was pulled over in June, police say she slapped a Beverly Hills cop. Harry? Thanks very much, Charlie. I want to get a check on our Monday morning. A lot of the talk at the Jim Baker trial now is about hush money. Baker's defense has been that he was not directly involved in PTL finances. But yesterday, as Bruce Hall reports, the court was given a very different picture. Richard Dorch, once Jim Baker's most powerful and trusted aide, testified that Baker authorized a $265,000 payment to keep Jessica Hahn quiet about their sexual encounter. Taking the stand as a prosecution witness, Dorch testified Baker told him to do what you have to to get the problem solved. Dorch said he confronted Baker about Han's charges that she had been raped, assaulted, and kidnapped by Baker during their encounter in a Florida motel. He said Baker denied the charges, but said there was a problem and to pay the money. It is the first time Dorch has detailed the payment to Han. I believe he and probably only he would have the direct story on that particular situation. I think the most exciting thing in all the world is our lifetime partnership. Oh, Jim, I... Dorch also testified that Baker saw the PTL partnership program as a gold mine, an unlimited source of funds for his religious empire. Over the years, PTL raised nearly $150 million through those timeshares and PTL hotels. Baker's attorneys are expected to place most of the blame on Richard Dorch for the financial woes at PTL. Dorch has already been sentenced to eight years in prison after pleading guilty to fraud and conspiracy charges. Defense attorneys say Baker was a minister manipulated by the powers behind the throne at PTL. But Dorch portrayed Baker as a person in total charge who orchestrated crises on his TV show because he believed they would produce larger contributions. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Charlotte. Not known. In Charlotte, North Carolina today, testimony in the Jim Baker fraud and conspiracy trial from people who helped finance what prosecutors charge was a kind of gospel of greed. For much of this week, proceedings have centered on charges that Baker, founder of television's lucrative PTL ministry, used almost $4 million in ministry funds to finance an extravagant personal lifestyle. Bruce Hall has our report. Former followers of Jim and Tammy Baker, who once gave openly to PTL, lined a federal courtroom today to criticize the way the Bakers live. 
The Reverend Alan Four, a small town Pennsylvania minister who sent more than $1,000 to PTL, testified that he felt robbed and cheated by the baker's extravagant lifestyle, by Jim's broken promises, and Tammy's expensive clothes and makeup. A half dozen other PTL partners, retired and on Social Security, said they were never able to get rooms they had paid for at PTL and that the ministry would not return their money. The biggest thing I would like to hear, which I've always wanted to hear, was Jim and Tammy to say, you know, we did make a mistake and we're very, very sorry for that. This afternoon, two of Baker's top aides were sentenced for tax evasion. Brothers James and David Taggart were given 17 and 18 year prison terms and half million dollar fines by the same judge who is hearing the Baker case. And there's a, unfortunately, uh, a feeling among white collar criminals that, that they're not gonna be incarcerated for crimes like tax evasion. Uh, and Judge Potter said that that's got to stop. As the trial completed its second week, events outside the courthouse have begun rivaling those inside. I said, hallelujah, I said, praise your holy name. Some spectators at the trial broke into prayer before being whisked away by a federal marshal. Talk show host Phil Donahue joined the growing parade looking for an exclusive interview with the Bakers. This is what I call a great story, period. He missed them departing, but did pick up a parking ticket. The government is expected to wrap up its case against Baker next week, with some of his closest aides testifying he diverted more than $4 million in PTL money for his own personal use. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Charlotte. The United States Senate has approved legislation that would protect millions of disabled Americans, including most AIDS sufferers, from discrimination on the job and in public places. There will be Final no moment of reckoning today or tonight for PTL founder Jim Baker. The Bakers left the federal courthouse in Charlotte, North Carolina, after a jury spent its first full day deliberating Baker's fraud and conspiracy case. The jury did not reach a verdict and recessed until tomorrow. The television minister and entrepreneur faces up to 120 years in jail on charges he defrauded PTL and PTL contributors out of millions of dollars. In Los Angeles, a California With his fraud trial in federal court nearing an end, PTL founder Jim Baker today came to the heart of his defense. He professed ignorance of major money matters, said he just didn't know about them, and he blamed his troubles on another television evangelist. Correspondent Bruce Hall is covering the trial. His followers are cheering him on, but Jim Baker's memory failed him on the witness stand today. Government prosecutors grilled Baker about more than $3 million in bonuses given to him between 1984 and 1987. Prosecutor Deborah Smith, do you remember receiving a $500,000 bonus on November 3rd, 1986? Baker, no, I don't ever remember receiving a bonus of $500,000. Smith, do you recall another $100,000 bonus six weeks later? Baker, no, I don't. Later, his attorney, George Davis, asked Baker to explain his salary and bonuses. The television evangelist responded, I raised $425 million for the Lord. I took less than 1% of the total income of the ministry. Baker repeatedly contradicted the testimony of the six other members of the PTL board of directors, saying they knew the financial woes the ministry was in, but still insisted on giving him millions in bonuses. Baker said the real conspiracy of PTL occurred when Jerry Falwell and his associates threatened the board of directors, forced them to resign, and took over PTL for their own selfish gain. Oh, the sun is shining. <laughs> this afternoon, the defense rested after calling 75 witnesses. Judge Robert Potter told the jurors he hopes to turn the case over to them Wednesday to decide the fate of Jim Baker on 24 counts of fraud and conspiracy. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Charlotte. This afternoon, televangelist Jim Baker faces sentencing at the hands of a judge with a reputation for toughness. Earlier this month, a jury in Charlotte, North Carolina, found Baker guilty of 23 counts of fraud and one count of conspiracy. The maximum sentence up to 120 years in jail and a $5 million fine. Charles Shepard is the author of Forgiven, the story of the rise and fall of Baker and the PTL. His reports on Baker for the Charlotte Observer won a Pulitzer Prize. And Charles Shepard joins us this morning live from in front of the federal courthouse in Charlotte, North Carolina, where Jim Baker is to be sentenced this afternoon. Good morning. Good morning, Kathleen. Charles, what do you think Maximum Bob is going to really hand down today to Jim Baker? I think we'll see a sentence ranging from probably about 30 to 50 years. If Mr. Baker's given 30 years or more, he'll have to serve at least 10 years before he's eligible for, for parole. Uh, so I think we can expect that minimum of 30 years. And would he go to a special facility? Well, I, he may well have to spend the night or several nights in the Mecklenburg County Jail 
If he's taken into custody immediately, which is very much a possibility, if he's allowed to report on his own, then I, I expect we'll see him in a, in a low security facility somewhere in the southeast, although he could be assigned to any federal prison in this country because of overcrowding in the federal prisons in this nation. How long have you covered Jim Baker? Uh, five years. I began in 1984 for the newspaper and then took two years off to research and write my book, Forgiven. And what is the one thing that you find to be the most disgraceful in all of the allegations or, or his behavior or, or some of the crimes that he has committed and now been convicted of? Well, I think uh, perhaps sad is the word that, that I would describe my feelings about Baker's, Jim Baker's inability uh, to, to heed the warnings, the many warnings he received over the years from people saying, Jim, you can't go this way. You have to tell the truth on the air. You have to, to grow and mature and let other people help you run this ministry. And Jim Baker could never relinquish that control and, and, and grow up, really. Why didn't he listen? Did he feel that at one point in time that he was a God child? I'm sorry, that he was a... That, that in some ways that he was a child of God and that did, he was immune to uh, any kind of uh, human punishment? Well, he, he talked of an anointing from God, which he had, and he, of course, used that very effectively with his viewers. Uh, but I think it was out of, uh, of tremendous insecurity and this driving passion and need uh, to get admiration from his followers. I think that was very much what, what was motivating him, although on the surface, and probably still in his mind, uh, what he wanted was to, to do God's work. But I think underneath it, it was, it was feeding his psyche, uh, his, his psyche, which was so wounded from, uh, from the earliest years of his life. So, in retrospect, how important was the Jessica Hahn revelation? Well, I think it certainly was the catalyst for all that has followed. Um, and, and probably uh, the supporters of Mr. Baker are fortunate uh, that, the, that the fraud, as it's now been uh, deemed to be by this jury, uh, has ended because we could have had tens or hundreds of millions more dollars change hands until uh, before PTL uh, fell. But I think uh, the, the Hahn matter itself probably is just a, some insight into uh, Mr. Baker's faulty moral barometer, the fact that this man didn't have a, a strong sense of right from wrong. Any possibility that Tammy Baker can face any charges? No, I, I don't think so at all. She was very much a part of the public face of this ministry. Uh, but behind the scenes, she was not making the administrative decisions. Will this possibly uh, go on to other televangelists around the country? Do you think that they'll be examined a little more closely by the IRS or the Justice yeah. Department? I, I think so. And I think, of course, that, that's already begun to take place. Uh, beginning in 1987, when the investigation began at PTL, and uh, federal investigation, and all the attention was put on the television broadcasting industry. and. We've seen, as a result, uh, several investigations by the IRS, civil audits, I believe, of some of the ministries around this country. And hopefully we'll see uh, more, scrut more uh, t hard questions being asked by the people who send telev television evangelists in this country money. They need to, to be the people uh, pursuing the truth. Charles Shepard, the author of Forgiven, about PTL and Jim Baker. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Kathleen. It's now 10 before the hour, Harry. Coming up next, new comedy with the kids in the hall. This is the CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. Almost half a century in prison, half a million dollars in fines. That was the sentence handed down today upon television evangelist Jim Baker, convicted of fraud and conspiracy. And so ended a fall from power and high living that began with the revelation of a brief sexual encounter with a young church secretary. CBS News correspondent Bruce Hall was in the courtroom in Charlotte. Jim Baker knew he was out of miracles and heading to jail when he arrived at the federal courthouse with his daughter, but without wife Tammy Faye. In the hearing, prosecutors asked for a long sentence, calling the television evangelist a liar, a con man who fleeced his followers out of $158 million in a classic pyramid scheme. Judge Robert Potter asked Baker if he had anything to say. Baker stood and said, I want to say I'm deeply sorry for those I have hurt. I have sinned, but never in my life did I intend to defraud. Judge Potter said top management of PTL was deceitful and untruthful, and Jim Baker was the head man, the man responsible. The Senate's 45 years, $500,000 fine. Baker looked straight ahead, not reacting. His daughter burst into tears. Prosecutors said the message was loud and clear. That you can't use television in the mails to make uh, fraudulent statements and representations to get people to send money to you. The now bankrupt and closed PTL Vacation Resort stands as a reminder of the bizarre mushrooming scandal 
that racked the multi-billion dollar religious broadcasting industry. At the urging of the prosecutors, Baker was ordered to jail immediately. We are concerned that he presents a flight risk. Family members refuse to talk about the severity of the sentence, but Baker's attorneys say they will appeal the conviction and the denial of bail. He is in as good a spirit as can be under the circumstances. He is, of course, concerned about the length of sentence, as we all are. Late this afternoon, Jim Baker was taken from the courthouse, handcuffed and shackled, and sent directly to a medium security prison in Talladega, Alabama, to begin serving his sentence. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Charlotte.